So I think it's time probably just to get right into our show and tell. Um, got a lot of people with things today, and I really appreciate that. And uh, then after that, we'll talk about the, uh, the pieces that have been submitted for the president's third challenge on boxes. And uh, let's go from there. So, Richard, are you queued up? You are. So, Mr. Mr. Hugh Bevan Thomas is number one on the, the show list. And Dave Fleissig, uh, warm up your vocal cords. You're next. Okay. Hugh. Hugh. So, um, uh, as you can see, uh, this was my first attempt at uh, using John Beaver's method. Uh, I actually built his jig five years ago when he did a presentation at our club uh, in person. And I never got around to actually doing uh, one of his uh, uh, cuts through, through a bowl. When I thought after the, the last presentation he did, I thought, damn it, I'm really going to, I'm really going to make, I'm going to do it. So I had this segmented bowl that I did. Needlessly, it was needless to say, I did it in, in two halves before the bowl was joined together. And so I just treated it just like a bowl. I had one problem. I couldn't shape the top of the bowl adequately because I wanted to have enough base uh, attached so that it was stable when I did the cut. Uh, the cut is not perfect. And, um, and I was a little disappointed and going through it, uh, I, I was watching it as I was passing it through and I saw that my blade jumped a bit and uh, that caused me uh, to say, you know, a nasty word, but well, there's nothing you can do when you're halfway through it, so you've got to keep going. So they weren't, it's, it's not perfect, um, but it, it works all the way around. I had to modify it just a little bit, and it became obvious that I wasn't going to be able to put a sandwich in between, or it just wouldn't look right. So what I did is then when I took the thin piece out and I just cut it back another quarter inch back and then I could fill in which I did with epoxy and with a, a, dark, a, a dark blue uh, dye in the, in the epoxy to uh, and it's a lace um, uh, epoxy method that I use um, but anyway so that was it. I'm, I'm going to do it again, and I'm going to see if I can improve on my technique. You will look forward to seeing one next month with uh, a little bit different. So keep at it. Good to do it. Thank you. Dave Fleissig, Ken Planter, right behind Dave. <clears throat> well, I, uh, for some reason, uh, like Japanese lacquer wear. So this is a uh, six inch square maple platter. Uh, that I painted to try to emulate lacquerware. I went, I've gone through a couple of iterations of this. Actually, I did one on the same piece of wood and turned it off because I didn't like it and then repainted it. So the short version is uh, this has both black and red rattle can spray lacquer. Uh, and then on top of that is acrylic which I put on with a brush. Uh, if you turn to that side view again, <clears throat> I decided to paint the edges, which I think made it look nice, and just did that by masking the back as well, which worked pretty well. Um, so the only thing I would say in terms of process on this is, you turn the platter just as if you were uh, making it you know, without paint, you have to get it perfectly flat, smooth, sanded, uh, because any defect in your finish or sanding is telegraphs right through the finish and you will see it and not be happy about it. So that's, uh, that's the piece. This COVID piece number what, 33 or something like that? Uh, something like that. Yeah, we're working on uh, David Fleissig and trying to get him to do one of our sawdust sessions. He's a little reluctant right now. so. If you have a chance to talk with David, twist his arm. He's been doing a lot with acrylics, and we'd love to see more about his techniques. Well, since I'm still here and not in the third person, I just <laughs> I am just not comfortable with worrying about dealing with the camera and the demo at the same time. Right. We'll keep working on you. 
<laughs> Ken Plant, uh, Bob Ackley right behind. Ken. Okay, so this was a piece of yellow pine I had uh, sitting on my shelf for about five years. It was bone dry. And uh, I've been seeing these three cornered bowls uh, around on a net, so I didn't want to try it. So the hardest part about this was milling that square uh, block. So anyway, it's about six by six. Um, I started turning it, and being at Yellow Pine, something I found out about it, it turned really nice, but there was a sap that would build up. It's like a, it was heat activated. Um, and even with the burr tools that I used for the uh, decoration and the texturing, in order to clean it, I had, actually, had to actually take a torch to it to burn that sap out of there. Hmm. But um, yeah, there, there we go. Some milk paint, some texturing, a little bit of uh, wood burning for the texturing. Uh, I didn't really get a good picture of that, but yeah, no, that's it. It's great. It's a Thank nice you. sharp corner, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Charlie, Mike Pagino right behind you. Oh, Robert Ackley. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I jumped my <laughs> list here a little bit here. Bob? Yep. Sorry. This is a basket illusion that I started on a while back. It's made out of maple. There's a... Uh, 140 radial lines burnt across that. It's based on a, uh, a reservation down by uh, Lake Havasu, the, the Kim Chevy Indians. And I looked at one of their baskets that was selling for, like this, it was $5,000. So it's kind wow. of interesting to see. Anyway, that was, took quite a while to do, obviously. This is the second basket I made. This is just based on my own ideas, and I just came up with this. It's a piece of, uh, of um, Wood that I found in my wood pile, and I just started working with it. There's no, but nobody, nobody, no particular Indian tribe, and it's got a hundred and it has 120 lines burnt across it. Hmm. Wow! How big That's are those? Beautiful. How big are those? Say again. How, how, how big? Are those? That sorry. one's about six inches across. That Bob, do you well. do you draw this out uh, on paper before you? uh start the piece yes i take a piece of graph paper and i figure out the design based on the diameter of the wood that i'm working with and how many how many uh different pieces of design that i want to put in it so yes that's how i do it same thing with that one and as you do it you count very carefully right yes i count very carefully <laughs> each one of those things is <laughs> colored in with a faber castell pen and dyed <laughs> A lot right. of work, as Jim as Jim knows. <laughs> yeah, I I count very carefully. <laughs> and I thank I thank Bob Nolan for, for encouraging me to do these kind of pieces. He's, yeah, I hope Bob would join us today, but uh, he's gotten a lot of us involved in uh, basket illusions or mosaic patterned uh, wear like that. But that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Uh, could you tell me what kind of a beading tool you use? Yeah, I use a D beading tool. Uh, you tool. lost the sound a little bit there, uh, but it's D-Ways. Uh, yeah, correct, D-Way. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Charlie Thank you. Saul, then Mike Regino. I got a little ahead of myself. Sorry about that. Well, good morning, guys. Nice to see everyone here today. Um, so this is, uh, have you ever had a thought um, of something to, to turn that it seemed like in your mind it was going to be pretty easy, but it just didn't turn out to be so easy. So, so uh, this is a, a, a candle holder. It's a honeycomb candle holder. Um, turns out that I have uh, 800 honeycombs. So it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's uh, a little bit like a, a basket illusion. It takes a little time. And um, so, and then the bees, of course, are raised. So everything has to be carved down from that. So that's a big part of the, uh, the work as well. Um, but yeah, so it, uh, it, it, what, it looks easier than it actually was. It was more difficult to do than I, than I thought. But anyhow, I enjoyed this project. And I actually have a second one, but I haven't, I haven't gotten very far in the second one yet. Um, so I have a pair. But uh, yeah, I thought it turned out pretty well. That's terrifically complicated to uh, keep those B uh, elevations while you carve away the rest of the surfaces. 
That's right. That that was a, a part of the challenge. Wow. Make those uh, bees look like they're they're actually working. <laughs> uh, again, absolutely creative. I really appreciate that. Mike Pugino, Jay Holland, we cue you in the, in the background here. Mike. Yep. Uh, this is another one of the resin bowls I did with Bedinga. And um, it was pretty, um, that Bedinga is really nice wood to turn. It turns like butter. It's just, you don't even have to sand it almost. It comes up so perfect off the tool. So it's a real, really nice wood to work with. So, so how is your, go ahead, I'm sorry. And this is a jig I made from, from John's, kind of redesigned it a little bit to uh, make wave bowls and stuff. So I haven't really, I was just, I had an old junk bowl, so I just cut it to see how, it, how good it worked. But uh, I guess next couple of weeks, I'll try to make a turn a bowl. But the fixture worked out really nice. It was really uh, easy to make and um, it really cuts really nice, really makes it simple. And I set it up so that there's lines that tell you what diameters and stuff and where to set it and everything. So it makes it set up really easy. Right, I can see that. Mike, back to your first piece with the resin. Could yeah. Could you talk a little bit about the process you used for that? Yeah, they're, there's a, they're kind of complicated. I have a CNC machine. So what I have to do is I have to make, one of the problems is, is I use a board, a flat board. So you start out with, let's say, one that's, you know, three quarter. And one of the problems is you're kind of limited. You have to find a board wide enough to make your bowl. And then what I do is I take them and I machine the slots and everything in there. And then I made a fixture st yeah. set up that I can then fill them full of resin. And then I have to put them in the pressure pot, uh, pressure pot them. And then I take them back out. And one of the problems I had in some of the other ones, I was doing them out of maple. And so when you put them in the pressure pot, the pressure would make the uh, aluminite uh, bleed into the wood. So I had to experiment with different ways to um, seal that. And I used uh, like shellac and things. And then one that I tried, I used some poly polyurethane. What I found with it is, is that when you glue it, the glue doesn't even stick to it. So after I glued the whole thing up, the rings were like coming apart. So basically what you do is you make these rings and you glue, and then you stack them up and glue them. And then you just turn it like a regular bowl. Uh, they're, they're kind of fun to make, but they're a lot of work. And I, the resin is such a mess to turn. The wood turns beautiful, but the resin is so messy. And uh, that's the only part I kind of don't like about making them because uh, turning the resin is not very good. But uh, they're, they're, they're kind of complex. I mean, I, I guess in the next meeting, I, can, I have some of the parts before they get glued up and things like that I can show. The Bedinga, I used uh, resin. I mean, uh, excuse me, epoxy instead of white glue and stuff because it's kind of oily. And uh, the epoxy actually worked really well for uh, gluing it up, gluing the pieces back together. But um, it's it takes a long time. <laughs> there, you know, turning the wood is really simple, but doing making the process of making the rings and stuff is very a lot of work. Yeah, show us some pieces next month, and uh, we would, I think you know a better understanding of how you how you approach doing this. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much. Jay Holland and Mr. Bentley, right behind Jay. Well, since I uh, cannot do too much work on the lathe right now uh, because of my legs and so on, I've been working on my pyography, and this is uh, Lighthouse Number 8. The idea came from a magazine uh, article in Pyrography 2020, an uh, article by Cy Easton on, starts on about page 81, I think, something like that. He was making a medieval-style cookie jar. And so I took a lot of his hints and everything else and turned it into a, a lighthouse. It's got an LED tea light and an antique uh, glass insulator for the dome. And there's actually hinges down there on the door. I couldn't believe the price of those hinges from a dollhouse store. Those were $8.50 a pair. 
Wow. So anyway, it was a lot of fun to do. And the next piece is uh, for one of the granddaughters. It's just more pyrography. I've been working a lot on that since I can't do the lathe work right now. So that'll be a Christmas present for one of the granddaughters. That's a 10 inch uh, basswood plate. Very good. Well, keep at it, Jay. You're great. And we appreciate the demos you've done for us in the past and look forward to uh, having you come to work with us uh, and demonstrate some more in the future. Appreciate that. Mr. Bentley, and we'll see if Bob Nolan is around to show us his piece. Uh, this is a tool based on the movie that Jim and I just finished. Uh, he made one with an eighth inch burr and uh, two, uh, two uh, ball bearings on the inside, or two bearings. And then this one, I increased the size of the tool to a, a burr that was a quarter of an inch, dropped in two, or no, actually I dropped in three earth magnets at the very bottom, and then put two larger uh, bearings in. And it worked great, and the day I was gonna use it, uh, that night I took my dog out for a walk and fell down and broke my arm. So I, <laughs> it's never been used. But I think it'll do a good job based on what uh, Jim had originally designed. There is a plan on a website for doing a similar kind of tool. I call this an elf tool. I think there was a brand that did this in the past. Um, but uh, I think in December for my demonstration, I'm going to talk to you about various decorative tools that you can make. This would be one of them. Thanks, David. Appreciate that. Mr. Nolan, are you around or not? I don't think so. But let's uh, take a quick look at his piece and then we'll move right on. Um, I can't say anything about it. Do you uh, know anything about it, uh, Richard? Um, no, I don't remember what he, I don't think he put anything in his email along with it, but it's a lovely, lovely little burl bowl with a, um, an Asian style top. And he, um, many months ago um, when we were meeting live came in with a bowl that he had cut the center out of to make it uh, give it that boat shaped appearance oh i see and this is the same construction so i don't know what he did with the top i don't see a i don't see a seam there on uh, either of these pictures but right here it appears to be somewhat pointy on the end yeah it's hard to tell but yeah the, uh, but the bowl itself is uh definitely um, seemed like that, but uh, just a beautiful piece. Too bad he's well, not here to tell us about it. Yeah, okay. Well, Gary Bingham, we keep you in the background and then John uh, after that. Hmm. Gary. Well, uh, we, uh, August 2nd, we moved to El Paso, Texas. And uh, so this is my uh, new uh, shop. Wow. And it's, uh, we, we just uh, love it down here. And uh, we got a, a house down here that uh, would have cost me in California a million and a half, two million dollars. And uh, so it's, you know, it's got uh, the uh, uh, jacuzzi, uh, pool. Uh, it's got no tank, uh, no uh, hot water tank. It's got the instant water, uh, solar. So it's uh, really uh, just best house I've ever lived in. We've owned eight houses uh, and uh, six of them we lived in. And this is it just, uh, it, that the workroom is a little tight and uh, the wood supply is not as uh, good as you guys have uh, up there in uh, your area. But uh, what I, the wood I'm getting is a pecan. And uh, what they do is they harvest it, I think once a year. So uh, I'm able to get uh, some of that. And so it's really dry uh, wood and I'm really not cutting it, I'm grinding it. <laughs> yeah. And How much the, did it cost you, the, the house? The house cost me, they wanted 660, I paid 640. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and it just, it, I, I can't tell you, it's the nicest house I've ever, and it was the model for the, the, the area. Uh, I, somebody asked me earlier, I had this conversation prior to the, the meeting start, uh, right across the borders of Juarez, there's about a, a probably 100,000 uh, people in El Paso, and it's got one of the lowest high crime rates in the United States uh, for a, size, a city its size. Now, Christ, of course, right across the, the border in Juarez, uh, that's not the case. 
Uh, yeah. but, uh, so I, you know, we, we, we everything, a lot of facilities and, and, and activities here. And uh, I got, I'm a member of a nice golf course, uh, military one over here. Uh, the last time we were here was in 1969. Uh, <clears throat> I, I went through a three month Vietnamese language school over at Fort Bliss here before I went back for my second tour of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, if you got any questions about it, oh, I'm, I'm saving $350 a month in taxes that I'm not paying in California state. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Well, keep coming back to the meeting. So I'm glad to see you again. And I uh, love the fact that you have these big windows in your shop that can uh, get some natural light in there. That sounds oh, great. It's fantastic. Got a nice view. We have a park right in the, in the back of the house uh, that belongs to the city. And then we got the Mount Franklin to look at. It's just beautiful. Uh, you got thank a part-time job as, uh, as a commerce guy for the community. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> John Langdon, how are you doing? Then Harry, John, 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 I saw you. Oh, I'm I'm here. There you go. Okay, uh, I'm doing. Uh, on the this this tree comes from a neighbor down the street. The oak tree just cut about two weeks ago now, and um, the live a white live oak, and so I just cut it in half, and I had a lot of uh, uh, succulents left over, and so I put that in there. Yeah, and the other picture, that that's from a um, a dead oak tree. Uh, no, excuse me, a black walnut tree, um, and it was about. I started off with about a ten inch piece, and there was so much white on there that the worm, worms just got in it. So I just kept cutting it down, cutting it down. So I ended up with about a five and a half inch bowl, uh, <laughs> and as you can see, it just really brought out the color of the bowl. And it turned out turned out very nice. So sometimes you just have patience and have to have patience in what you're doing. And in this case, I did, but uh, I wish it was a little bit bigger. Yeah, but it's got a beautiful grain pattern right through it. Yeah, it does. Looks, yes, looks really nice. Thanks, John. Thank Harry, you. what do you got for us? Uh, you know, we just recently had Cindy Droja in, but this is not the first time we've had her at our our meetings. A number of years ago, we had her. And I was so impressed with the beauty and grace of her work, I decided to try uh, to make something that uh, simulated that, that beautiful work that she does. So this was my effort to do that. This is a Buckeye burl. It has a, a collar uh, inserted, also black, uh, black wood, and then the black wood uh, finial. Uh, the piece is a small piece, about uh, four inches in diameter. And I just love her work, the, the beauty and delicacy and grace of, of it. Anyway, so that's it. That's great. Beautiful. Yeah, I do remember when she was here last time. It was a long time ago. Long time Mike, ago. Michael yeah. Hackett, followed by Vern, please. Hi, everyone. Um, this is a piece of walnut um, that I got from John Cobb at a barbecue. And they were supposed to be rifle butts. So they're all long uh, pieces. I've done a couple of them before, but I, this is the first piece I've done more uh, hand carving on. Um, so the, the center line from the bowl to the arc at the bottom here, um, that's nine inches and like 15 sixteenths. So anybody with a 20 inch lathe realizes that that is right down to the bed. Um, so I, kept as much of the piece as I wanted. A lot of fun hand turning, um, or hand carving rather. I have that master carver and a lot of rasp work as well. Um, but one little piece. It's interesting what simple designs require so much work to create and it came out very, very nicely. Right. Thank you. Thank you. A piece of my Family's kicking right in there to support your presentation. <laughs> Vern, how are you doing? And then Rick Nelson will close out our show and tell. Okay, this I was uh, digging around some uh, wood chips looking for firewood and I found this root ball. I have no idea what kind of wood it is. Um, I had to clean out the, the, the dirt and rocks. I ended up using an ax because I didn't have a power washer. I just mm. chopped the stuff out. It's a, a real dense wood. 
when I started turning, I could only do 200 RPM. And the fastest I turned it was at 400. Wow. The whole bowl, because it would just shake the power matic all over the place. Um, uh, I started with a bowl gouge, but it was, I had to fight it and it kept dulling real quickly. So I, I had a homemade uh, hollowing tool with a carbide tip. It was five eighths inch steel rod. And that did a lot better job of turning it. And so it turned out pretty good. It was, it was already dry when I started. So, and it's 14 inches in diameter. Wow. So it's pretty good size. Yeah, that looks dangerous to have done. <laughs> well, that's why I left it thick, too. I didn't get it too thin. Well done. Thank you. Rick. Rick Nelson, where are you? You're this here. This started out to be there something entirely different. Um, I actually uh, was sort of inspired by Joel's square bowls that he was doing over uh, you know, the last six or eight months. So I decided to try and do one of those with a segmented process. And then the intention was to go back to the table saw with a sled and square it up. Oh, okay. Uh, but uh, in the end, I got this far with it and I decided, you know, I kind of like just the way it is. So it's uh, one of the things I like about segmenting is you can get a little representational uh, with your pieces. And so this is uh, looked like a mountain sunrise to me. Mm. And that's the story. It does look like a sunrise. Beautiful. That is uh, that is a type of segmentation I have not had a chance to see before. So I appreciate the creative uh, look of this thing. Thank you. Maybe you'll see more pieces in that style. Well, guys, thank you. Uh, we do have a presence challenge. And I know that the number of people participating this month is going down just a little bit. Well, I'm not going to do anything complicated for you in the future. As you know, next month, it's all about Christmas ornaments of your own style. And uh, I would expect our show and tell and President's Challenge to merge because we're all going to be doing Christmas ornaments. I know you are. Right? Everybody nod, please. Yeah, some of you are. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, President's Challenge. Uh, we ask for you to consider making another box, our third in the row this time with two of the following three characteristics. One, chatter work, hand-turned threads, and paint. And uh, you can pick any two of those three to combine in your third box. So let's see how it came out. Ken gets us started off with the first of the boxes. And then Dave Fleissig is going to talk about how he did it. Ken, go for it. Okay. So this was my first uh, go with chatter work. Never done it before. I've, I've seen it never looked into it. So uh, I read a couple partial articles, watched a couple partial videos. And uh, as far as making a tool, I, I got me an old steak knife. Um, oh. Rounded up. <laughs> yeah, uh, people are saying, you know, hacksaw blades and, and butter knives. So the steak knife seemed to work. I ground it up and uh, I, I went for it. Uh, not realizing chatter works meant for end grain. Hence the cove on the piece. That was my first design change. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that worked out, and, and I already I had turned the bowl. I had the lid. The lid's beautiful, um, nice snot, you know, a uh, snap pop uh, fit to it. So I started to go to work on the uh, top of it, and uh, I decided I wanted to modify the tool because it wasn't quite working out. It was a little too round, so I put a little bit of a point on there. Went to shave it off and ended up with a donut. So uh, I got this piece of uh, cocoa bolo fitted that in there, and then the chattering worked. And uh, yeah, there we go. That's my first uh, attempt at chatter work. I put some paint on it and called it done. Oh, good. And uh, now we'll work on another one that'll be end grain, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get a different effect. Great. Exactly. Thank you. David Fleissig, and then I'll follow after David. Well, this was uh, my first attempt at uh, chatter work also. Uh, and there it is. Um, I found it really difficult. That's an insert of uh, African blackwood cut from one of those clarinet bells that you can get, the reject clarinet bells. What surprised me about the chatter work after watching videos and trying it a couple of times was how hard you had to press it to get anything to work, uh, even on African blackwood. 
So uh, it was uh, it was a challenge. The paint is uh, uh, rattle can uh, black lacquer and then uh, iridescent uh, acrylic on top of that and then clear on top of all of that and just a uh, pop finish, uh, no threading. <laughs> I love it. You just do great work with that uh, acrylic material and we still want to know more about it. <laughs> okay, I brought a couple of pieces too. Uh, first one is the demo piece that I did in the video when I showed you uh, the techniques. So this is, uh, uh, I have never tried threading Osage Orange before, but it turned out that it takes wonderful threads. And uh, so that's Osage Orange for the body and uh, Blackwood for the top. And this was the uh, demo piece I did on the video. And the second piece, Richard, is uh, one I did um, for the challenge of myself. Again, threaded, uh, it's Coco Bolo lid. Uh, again, uh, Osage Orange, because I'm really beginning to like it. It uh, works out really nice. So I challenged myself with a third piece, which was the most difficult of all. Uh, this is solid acrylic. The block it's sitting on is one inch square. So you can imagine how small this is. It's still 16 TPI threads. Uh, the bottom is chattered on the inside. Uh, so I actually hollowed it from the bottom, put an insert base in, and then threaded the uh, top. So that was more difficult than anything <laughs> was doing this one. Uh, again, 16 TPI threads and chatter work. And uh, for my demo next month, we'll talk a little bit more about chatter tools. I think it's a really neat kind of thing. And uh, like Ken was saying, uh, you can make them out of almost anything. It'll be kind of fun to uh, uh, talk about chatter tools uh, and uh, texturing tools. This was not chattered, by the way, on the bottom. This was textured on with a tool very much like what David uh, Bentley was showing you. So that's mine. So, so Jim, on the, the first lid. Um, yes, there. Is that, is that an insert on the top? Because there's no thread relief from what I'm seeing there. Uh, on the lid. Right. Well, first of all, if you go slow enough, you can get by with a very, very small thread uh, relief. Uh, so my lathe goes down to pretty low speeds, and I can cut right up to that shoulder. It does take a, a quick hand to be able to extract the tool uh, <laughs> before you bash it into the top. Uh, or you can turn the threads, cut it off, and glue it back on again, uh, eliminating the thread relief. Now, yeah. go to the second one, um, Richard, there. Uh, this is also done exactly the same way. Um, you can't quite see the third thread, but I am actually able to get by with very small thread relief, just slow speed and quick hands. And again, there's chatter work on the inside of this Coco Bolo lid, and that's on cross grain, and um, it doesn't work so good on cross grain but that's where you need the um, uh, uh, decorative tool rather than a chatter tool to work cross grain. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk about that next month. Okay, um, Charlie and then Peter. Well, um, I did uh, the chatter work and the um, hand chase threading also. This is pear wood and it has the, uh, uh, the it has the chatter work on the inside. I think it kind of looks like kind of a cosmic uh, design there, uh, kind of black and blue. Uh, and uh, in, a, in the pair, the thread chasing turned out fine. I wasn't particularly happy with the um, conical kind of Christmas tree look that, uh, that uh, the finished appearance. So I actually decided to do another one. And so on the second one, I did, um, uh, again, thread chasing and chatter work, but I used a beetle nut. Mm. And uh, this is the first time I used a beetle nut. Um, and I, I really like that. Um, this one also, um, uh, you know, the grains align when you uh, completely uh, thread the piece. So I was happy about that. And the, um, and the bead work, um, the bead work around the uh, the around the uh, waist and also at the top are 
um, our madrone instead of pear. And uh -huh. it, it looked really good um, while I was turning it. Um, but then when I put a finish on it, there just wasn't enough contrast. So I have to say that I'm very pleased with how the piece turned out or mechanically works. But ultimately, I think I would have been a lot happier with woods that uh, look different. So it really uh, would pronounce that I had actually done more work. Um, and I like the beetle nut a lot. And this is the first beetle nut I used. It's, I believe, a little bit too large for this piece. Uh, but I'm very pleased with that. Great. We keep you and making then, some more boxes then. Yeah. And then what I did is because I like the beetle nut, I decided to go back to the conical piece and and simulate a beetle nut on the top. And I think it kind of sets it off a little bit better. So that's what that one is. Oh, I see. And then um, what the, and then this shows the chatter tools that I use. So uh, the chatter tool on the left is uh, made out of actually a, a skill saw blade that I cut with my four inch grinder and uh, just use that metal rounded on one end and pointed at the other and just insert it into a pipe with a with a um with a screw and then the other is um to be able to utilize some of my burrs i just used a fordham handpiece mm. ah without mm. plugging it in so that's where your bearing comes from i never thought about that great that, idea. that's right it's an easy way to do it i've never thought about that what a great idea well, I learn something every day, I'll tell you, especially here. Thank you. Peter Nakatani and then Mike Regino. Okay, so this piece, um, so I cheated. This is not a hand-turned thread. It's, it's a triple lead CNC um, item, and it's painted. So it's directly threaded. The base is directly threaded into sycamore. So I made it tough on myself because I made use the softest, mushiest wood I could. Um, and then the lid is ebony with a little um, ruby. It's a true ruby. Uh, it's, well, it's a synthetic ruby um, implanted on the bottom of the, the lid. And then I painted it and gold leafed it. And the paint's kind of cool because it switches from purple to blue, depending on how the sun hits it. Oh, wow. Neat. That's gold leaf on the top then. Yes. Oh, wow. Sort of. Sort of. Well, I, can, I, can, I have some true gold leaf. This stuff comes from Thailand, and it was sold as 24 karat, but it, it's not because I know what true gold leaf feels like. This ain't it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter. Yeah. Mike Regino and Gary Sadits after that. All right, here's two boxes. I, the first one is the one on your first president one, which I kind of did late. <laughs> and then the second one is a threaded one. And um, I, I used, uh, for the threads, I made inserts and mounted the inserts at a boxwood. And... Um, the thread cutting was really fun. I really liked doing that. It, you know, that was my second box I'd ever made and um, cutting the threads and stuff. I experimented with a lot of different woods and I had, first I did threads out of the 20 pitch and with the softer woods and stuff, it just doesn't work. And I found with the 16 pitch, it was actually easier to cut the threads in different style woods, but it cut it in the box wood just perfect. Perfect. You know, there's no, the threads just absolutely come out perfect on them. So that looks like I really, pick. Pardon? That looks like I, I pipe pay wood. Uh, it's some wood that Peter Travis gave me that he got from China, and they, and he said the guy told him they called it uh, Chinese mahogany. It's uh, oh, okay. Pretty hard. It's very very hard. The threaded lid one was some uh, ash that I had and make the top just of a different color and stuff to a little add a little character to it. Okay. Great. Very nice. There are a few woods that chatter, I mean, uh, thread very easily, and there are a lot of woods that do not. 
and uh, it limits our choices of things. But like you uh, said, Mike, is once you find a good wood like boxwood, it threads, threads like butter once you get the rhythms down. Appreciate it. Well done. So Gary and closing out, will be Vern Stover. Before you start, Gary, just a reminder to Cheryl. Um, oh, yeah, your, thank you. Set your timer. OK, Gary, go ahead. <laughs> Gary, you there? Your box is. Your box is. The box is made out of unknown wood. <laughs> uh, I've had it for some time. Don't know what it is. Um, I tried cutting threads in it. It, didn't, it would cut. But it would leave little chips in it, so it didn't look very good. So I got a, had some iron wood, so I made, cut the threads out of that, made inserts, put it into there. And then up for the top, I used the chatter tool I made with a sawzall blade and a holder. So it turned out pretty good. Yeah, beautiful. And the, thread, the threaded part was made out of iron wood. Very nice. Nice. Thank you. Mr. Stovall, close us out here with this very complicated presence challenge. Okay, I, I, this is the first time I've done threads or uh, chatter work. So uh, I tried uh, lignum vitae, I, and it kind of didn't work so well, and I didn't have anything hard. So I remember doing that root ball bowl, and that wood was real hard and real dense. So I went to the firewood pile and, and pulled <laughs> some out. and. Uh, Oh, yeah. tried a couple of these and it chattered fine and threads were okay they're they're not really great so this is the third one i made and it, it's not even sanded because when i screw it together the edges don't line up it's off so uh, there's still things to work on it's, it didn't come out perfect so it's a good start. Now, I also see that it's on a cross grain piece of wood, and so it takes chatter work a little less easily, but is no, more prone to. No, it, that's the end grain. That is end grain? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, beautiful. Thank you. Um, I did a video on chatter tools um, some time ago. So, those of you who have not uh, played with chatter work, you might want to go back into the Barry Woodturner's uh, video library and look up my video on chatter work uh, and look at the various different chatter tools. I will be doing chatter work and I will be doing these texturing tools both in the demonstration next month. And for thread cutting, I think we have a video, David, I did on uh, thread cutting someplace or other, probably back in the library too, among those 60 or 70 videos that we've done. Yes. Uh, one of the tools that I have found is the new one from Carter and Sons. Uh, uh, it's a double-ended tool. It's a 16 PPI tool, which is um, uh, turned out to be the one I use the most frequently. I found some of the older ones from uh, Sarbi weren't as convenient to use in my hand as the the new one from Carter and Sons. So I kind of fell back to using that a lot. Uh, if you're new to uh, cutting threads, you want a tight-grained wood, uh, and you would think that coarse threads would be easier and fine threads would be harder. It's the other way around. Uh, for your first uh, thread cutting activity, uh, you need to keep your lathe speed down low. If you have a smaller lathe, you're probably limited to 500 RPM, which is really pushing it. Uh, those of you who have larger lathes can crank the speed lower than 500. Uh, I was doing all my threading at about 350 RPM. Uh, so you want to keep it at a low, low RPM so that you get the rhythm going. And a lot of practice, a lot of practice. 16 TPI is easier to do than uh, 10 or 12. 20 is easier to do than 16 when you're first getting started because your body motions are slower uh, to trace and follow that thread. And then as you get better, uh, move up to 16 or even down to 12 or 10 if you want to. But it seems to be the most common one right now is 16 TPI, and that's the only one that Carter & Sons makes. Uh, their tool is a little overly expensive, but uh, once I've used it, I've found it worked really great. So uh, if you're interested in getting to more of this kind of work, I, I know I pushed, uh, pushed a little bit on some of this uh, for this demonstration. Next month's easier. You get to do whatever you want to do. <laughs> Make a Christmas art. That's the key. And I know there's some inside out ones we're going to see. They're going to be gorgeous. And then there's going to be 
uh, the shape uh, that you most prefer and that you're going to probably share with family and friends. Um, and then I've got a few suggestions uh, have come forward to Anna and, and Jim have sent me a, a couple of emails about possible uh, things for January. And if you have some ideas, please send me an email and let me know what you're thinking about because I want to have something that we all will play with and, and uh, push our skills a little bit, but also be able to share new ideas. I learned a couple of things just watching these today that I had not even thought about before. Um, and that's great. That's the whole point of this. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.